they decided to have a conversion set again, knowing that there was a lot of people there for um, tornado to test, and he didn't want to be there for that. They put on the program. So you saw it? Yeah. You, were, you were there? Well, then not for, I, mean, the, 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 I was there for one of the uh, cultural events he did that uh, night, because I was running the center yeah, the rest yeah. of the time. Oh, cool, cool. And, uh, yeah, no, it was tremendous. Yeah. Tremendous stuff. I love that ability. That's perfect. Yeah. Like, we'll do this. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, what? This is level inequality. And of course, these aren't going to be right, right? Because I don't. But they're going to be right enough. 
consequences of the neoliberal turn is that cities in the American context get far less money from the government than they once did. Right? So there is a moment in time where each American city would get a fraction of the money they paid in taxes to the federal government back to them. They would get that money back and be able to use that to take care of their populations. Right? But gradually over the course of the 70s, that money was cut off, forcing cities to be increasingly entrepreneurial in coming up with ways to deal with these issues. Right? So bond rates, so what they would do is they'd float bonds in order to raise money. They'd say, well, listen, we want to build this if, you know, and we'll, we'll uh, float a bond and then we'll pay you interest back on your investment. We'll use the money you give us to build our stuff, you know, usually downtown stuff, you know, stadiums, casinos, et cetera, and the like, and then we'll pay you interest based on that. You need a bond rating agent in order to say what type of bond it is, right? Because investors are looking at this product and like, okay, we've got a choice between this bond over here, this bond over here, this bond over here. We want to get our loot back. Which of these bonds is the best bond to give us the bang for the buck? So you bring in a bond rating agent. The bond rating agent ends up serving as a tool of governance, right? Because cities need that money. In order to get that money, they have to get a high bond rating. In order to get the high bond rating, what do they have to do? Whatever the bond rating agent tells them to do. So what does the bond rating agent tell them to do? Well, in order, you're spending too much of your fiscal capacity on social service provision. We need you to do X, Y, and Z. And although I'm talking about the United States as a case, focusing on cities, for those of you who understand this dynamic internationally, we know that this is the same type of process that goes on with international lending agencies in many third world countries. It's the exact same type of technology, it's just applied to the city level. Right? And then you have the example of workfare, where instead of giving money, you know, we all know, how many parents do we have in here? Okay, so I'm a parent. There's no way in hell that parenting isn't work up there in your home. There's no way in hell parenting isn't work if they're in your home and you are not, and that's the only place you're working. There's no way in hell that's not work. But what's the solution? Right? So you've got, a, you've got a single parent who's got children to take care of, doesn't have the money to make ends meet. What's the solution to that? Right? The solution to that is, oh, we've got to force you to work. You don't know how to work, so we have to train you to work. And in exchange for you working and working to get a job, we will then give you resources. Right? That's what workfare looks like. It's important to understand in the, in, um, in the national context. I mean, you guys always know, you guys know this, but it's important to say out loud. We, there's this tendency, particularly in election cycles, to argue that this dynamic is the function of one political party versus the other. Right? So in this case, it's easy, for example, to argue that Mitt Romney is the neoliberal here and Obama's the hope and change guy. But over the course of time, it's important to understand that this is a bipartisan effort. Uh, Bill Clinton repeals welfare, right? Um, as far as bond rating agents, I'm a Detroit guy. Uh, Detroit mayors are predominantly Democratic. They're the ones who are at, who are making sure that the city fits the the, the bond rating dictates. You know, here um, you had a question. I just at the end of this point, that you know, I was going to say, ask you if you could talk about prison, <coughs> prison fare in conjunction with that too. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, it's also, uh, they're also, in as much as prison, prisons end up working as a, as a way to expropriate resources from the state for, well, let me figure out another way to say that. Um, how would I put prisons? Oh, yeah. So, so prisons work here in a couple of different ways, right? So just as we can argue that Republicans are the ones that are hard on crime and, and put that there, it's important to note that under Bill Clinton, um, black, there are more laws that become like federal offenses under Bill Clinton than under any uh, president before him. Right? Um, mayors in city after city after city create policies that make it a lot easier for police to use heavy-handed tactics against um, against populations, against black uh, working class populations. 
So that's one way to think about how it works in the city as far as how it works outside the city. I can talk about that, but I'll get to that in a minute. So this is the, uh, neoliberalism as a set of public policies. We can also talk about the role of education in here as a, in as much as education is a state dynamic. But neoliberalism can also be conceptualized as a set of as kind of a framework that non-government institutions actually deploy, right? So here, I talk about the prosperity gospel and social entrepreneurship. I'm going to focus more on this, less on this. Uh, prosperity gospel, how many of you have no idea, no idea what I'm talking about when I talk about the prosperity gospel? Okay. So, um, the... Uh, the prosperity gospel is the fastest, not fastest, uh, the quickest, but uh, is a, uh, the prosperity gospel is a religious doctrine that has, that has, uh, that is the fastest go growing sector of Protestantism in the United States and in some sectors of the world. And it's based on one simple principle. If you live, a, uh, if you live uh, the life that Jesus would have you live, right, this is the straight line, right, this is the standard, then you will not only be spiritually prosperous, you will be materially prosperous, right? So the Bible ends up becoming a guide not just for life, but a guide for spiritual, uh, for physical wealth, right? And there are a number of segments, there are a number of specific components of the Bible that are used to drive home this message and are used to expropriate wealth from, you know, I forgot to, I forgot to mention it as a side note, turn on your cell phones to vibrate because what I'm going to do, and this is going to be dope because you're going to be on videos, I'm going to talk about you, I'm going to lovingly talk about you, but I'm going to talk about you. What's your name? Oh, Ben. Sorry. No, 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 I, I, I didn't That's mention it. That's not on you. That's not on you. I didn't mention it. I'm supposed to mention it. It's my um, so, so to expropriate wealth from from churchgoers, right? So, there's a section in the Bible that talks about the responsibility of a Christian to one's church that deals with the issue of tithing. Tithing is the dynamic of you actually giving some percent of your income to the growth of the church. In this case, giving money to the church ends up becoming a measurement of the degree to which somebody's living, living uh, according, to the, uh, according to the guidelines of the Bible. Right? Now, in as much as churches are becoming increasingly entrepreneurial, they are, in many cases, forced to actually get money from their parishioners and, or from their church goers in order to continue, uh, in order to maintain the regular dynamics of their church. Right. So if you, so I've got a number of CDs at my home uh, because uh, my family used to attend a church uh, in the neighborhood that kind of articulates something like this. And instead of arguing, for example, that poverty is the result of structural factors, that poverty is a result of things that are outside of the human control, poverty is a result of these forces that we need to organize against, what this dynamic trends towards is a dynamic in which poverty is explained as individual failures and as individual religious failures, right? So it's not just individual failures on a job, it's as an individual religious failure, right? So this is kind of the way that if we think about neoliber neoliberalism as a set of ideas about the market embedded in institutions, the prosperity gospel is one, uh, is one vehicle through which we see this. Um, ideationally, right? Um, as far as, and then it has a flip side. So even if you look at the design of churches now, you've got the explosion of what we think of as mega churches. These churches that house literally, in some cases, several thousand members. And if you look at their design, they're actually designed more like. Um, more like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? More, they're not quite designed like businesses, but they're not designed like churches, right? Oh, 
Yeah, uh, yeah, like malls. They design like tricked out malls. Like some of, number of them have ATMs inside. A number of them have stores inside. Where as soon as you see the video of the pastor, because it's being videotaped, you can go and buy it, right? So the church ends up becoming kind of, of uh, a manifestation for uh, for neoliberalism, right? So you can think about neoliberalism as a set of ideas embedded in kind of um, institutions as well as a set of public policies. Uh, finally, uh, and then after I talk about this, I'm going to talk about race, and then 3.30, I think it'll give me time to flesh these ideas out and time for us to have a discussion. Finally, we can think about neoliberalism as a set of ideas that we actually imbibe and reproduce ourselves. So there's a tendency when we talk about ideology to think about ideology as something that's given to us that we have to kind of sort of take. When what it really is, when another way to think about it is something that allow is in this case is think about neoliberalism as a set of ideas that give us the ability to govern ourselves in a certain way to the point where for many of us but not most of us many of us don't need an active agent outside of us telling us to hustle. We know we have to hustle on our own, right? Um, so, what are these quotes? So, The Hundred Dollar Startup, that's a, a book written by, I forget the author, I'm not going to be able to pronounce the author's last name, but it's a, a book designed to empower people through creating businesses, right? So, it's like, wow, the way, the best way, you don't like your job, you feel like your job sucks, you feel like, you know, nothing's working right for you, all you need is a website and desire and some other things and then you can actually empower yourself to transform the world. It's not a hundred dollar political organizing campaign, it's a hundred dollar startup, right? Um, this is not what they hired me for. This quote actually comes from the president. Mm -hmm. President, which one? Um, Bush, uh, Obama said it and Bush has said it, right? It's the whole idea, now, now know how that works. You think that's kind of innocuous, right? But what, when you think about neoliberalism as a set of ideas by which the market governs us or governs things outside of the market, this becomes a little bit more um, insidious, I think is the word, right? Where that word is being swapped out for something else. So what should be here? We're talking about a government actor. What word should be here? Elected, right? So when you swap that thing out, it's about swapping out election. And it's not just a synonym. Electing someone is different than hiring somebody. right? It's a totally different process, totally different ideas embedded in it. But there's a variety of other ways you could think of where market language, the language of private industry in the market, has replaced and subsumed public language. right? Language of politics, language of the state. Right? This is not what they hired me for. The president as CEO. Right? I was just talking uh, to my man from Detroit about Dave Bing. Dave Bing um, used to play basketball for the Pistons in the 1970s. He's one of the best basketball players ever, um, ever to wear the Pistons uniform. For real. For real. Real talk. Um, he becomes a CEO of a steel industry. CEO of Bing Steel. Detroit's previous mayor... Uh, Kwame Kilpatrick runs into legal issues, and he needs to be replaced. Dave Bing was posited, why? Not just because he is a Detroit guy, but because he has business expertise. And what we need is someone with business expertise. A CEO would be perfect. That's basically, to jump to the election thing, that's basically what Mitt Romney's idea is now. It's like, okay... I am a CEO, I've got management idea, I know. I've got management uh, expertise, and I can turn this country around, right? I'm not a business man, I'm a business man. Who said this? Jay-Z. Yeah. So Jay-Z, in a uh, Kanye West track, yeah. uh, Diamonds, 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 uh, no, Diamonds from Sierra Leone, yeah. right? <laughs> he gives this line, it's a throwaway line. Right? It's a throwaway level. I'm not a businessman. I'm a businessman. But no, if you look through hip hop, if you look in a number of different ways, we are asked to be entrepreneurs of ourselves. Right? We are asked to be, not to be, there are a whole number of things we could be, 
we could think of ourselves as being, but an entrepreneur is a very specific type of agent. A business is a very specific type of institution. It does a very specific thing. And what he's saying here is that, and he's not critiquing it, he's describing himself as if it were a good thing. Like, I am a business. One of the things that, we, that uh, happens at, when this neoliberal turn occurs within uh, economic theory is individuals are, uh, is people begin to think of individuals as owners of their own human capital. So just like you, if you had a, have a plant, a physical plant, the way you develop that plant is to put money in it and grow it to, uh, to change the way it delivers the services, to make it more efficient. We become entrepreneurs of ourselves. And there are people who have the capacity to build and develop their own human capital, and then there are people who don't, right? The people who can develop their own human cap capacity Cities who can develop their own human ca capacity. Institutions who can develop their own human capacity. They are given resources, race to the top. They are given resources. They are uh, given wide berth. Spaces are created for them. Institutions are created for them. For people who cannot, that's when the stick is applied. Right? So whether you're talking about uh, draconian welfare regimes, whether we're talking about um, increased, uh, uh, increased uh, prison, um, prison dynamics, uh, whether we're talking about in schools, you know, penalizing teachers and students in schools who can't you know, lift their grades up, it's the same dynamic. So here I talk about technologies of subjectivity, technologies of subjection. Subjection are used for the losers. Subjectivity is used for people who are the winners. Right? Now, I've got a few more minutes. What I haven't talked about is the role of race in this. Uh, I'll just say real quick. In the United States context, the only way you can make this turn, the only way you can create a dynamic where we take a, we not only take um, a social safety net away, we not only take a social safety net away, but we replace it with a draconian version, is if we somehow create a dynamic where the winners think of the losers as being a separate and distinct population, right? And the way that works in the United States context is that losing population is non-white, right? So you see, so we've conduct, I'm a political scientist, I've, we've conducted experiments on this. You show people um, an image of a, of a woman on welfare um, and you, chain, you ask them questions about uh, the woman on well, you, uh, you ask them questions about poverty after showing them this image and some other things. But the only thing that changes is the race of the woman on welfare. Nothing else changes. And you show that you ask pretty much the same population in two different cases questions. You know, uh, what's the cause of poverty? How do we best deal with it? And what you find is that people who are exposed to that black woman on welfare are far more likely to say that poverty is the fault of the individual. Uh, and they're far more likely to say that the best solution is to force them to work, right? It's the same thing with crime. It's the, almost the, exactly the same thing with crime. So what we do is, what's happened is through a variety of different processes, once you, we've tabbed the losers as being like non-white, hence non-human in a certain way, and then that makes this neoliberal <coughs> rollout much more understanding, or uh, that makes this neoliberal rollout much more uh, interpretable and it makes it much more acceptable. Um, so on that note, that gives us a nice 20 minutes for discussion. This is kind of ragged, but I think I've given you uh, I've given you a decent set of parameters in which to understand what neoliberalism is, distinct and separate from how we might think of capitalism as a whole. All right. And uh, do me a favor when you're asking questions, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Scott. Uh, I live in Baltimore. Um, one of the things that I found uh, interesting recently is how um, uh, economic or economists have gone out of their way to show how racism is not profitable. Um, like that, uh, anti-racism is now a neoliberal argument um, because to have racist standards for your workforce would be to necessarily exclude potential workers. Um, and the larger the pool of potential workers, the larger the supply drives down the cost of the workers. And so, a divided workforce along racial lines 
is not economically prof profitable. This theory came out, you know, decades ago, yeah. um, but it's kind of resurfaced in recent years that the um, that it's it's uh, that racism is not profitable. Um, and so, I mean, like, what do you think of that um, model? I mean, is that a, is that a helpful tool, something we should seize on from the left to, the, to emphasize to businesses that it's not in their economic interest to be racist, or is that playing into the whole game, uh, and therefore you end up via anti-racism uh, feeding back into the neoliberal machinery? Um. That's an excellent question, um, and, and when I when I talk about this issue, there are two sets of uh, simultaneous dynamics that are occurring. So there are resources that are differentiated, differentially allocated by race, right? That the neoliberal turn allows for, but then simultaneously there are resources within both white. Of, uh, both racial groups we label as white and racial groups we label as not white. Whether you're talking about blacks, Latinos, etc. Their resources are differentially, differentially allocated by class. So using the language of neoliberalism in this case to make an anti-racist claim has the effort, has, I believe, a beneficial effect of smoothing over racial differences but it still leaves intact that intra-racial class distinction, right? Where there are, and this is what I study, where there are black populations that believe that there are some black populations, like the ones that perform Friday night, who don't believe that they actually deserve care or life. And those populations are not necessarily the ones that would be benefited by that anti-racist um, economic move as far as the labor force. In fact, in fact, I would argue that some people would make the argument that that, popul that, that population, and given that we're in a mixed company, um, I'll just spell the, you know, I'll spell the word rather than say it. Um, that population of N-I-G-G-A's, or given that most of you guys are white, N-I-G-G-E-R-S's, um, that that population actually shouldn't. That, that population should be as cordoned off from everybody else as possible. That argument you're making doesn't really deal with that, and actually in some ways reifies it. I really like this distinction, the technologies of subjectivity versus technologies of subjection. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that a little bit. I think it's just a great phrasing. I mean, that's really, really key. Yes. And uh, if you can enlighten about that. And then yeah. um, just uh, one other, just kind of like a stab at it. If you think of the way that... If uh, the way that markets don't work, like supply and demand is, like you know, largely mythological, right? And so, like if you're buying a car, the uh, you, the price is determined between the buyer and the seller, amongst other things. Well, mostly that, but that doesn't include the price of the car, environmental destruction, so on and so forth. That's not including the price of a car. And this price is labor the same way, you know. And so working to, and so uh, the actual cost of racism isn't included in the negotiation of wages per se. Because it's the same kind of mispricing, because markets don't actually know how to price anything according to the actual cost. And so using that argument might not even be true by neoliberal standards. It could still be very highly profitable uh, to have racism, for example. And I'm guessing that it probably is. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, as I think about it, and then I'm trying to answer your question. I mean, so there are, um, there are people can charge a premium, right? So, so yeah, there are some there are some there are some real profit centers by which everybody profits, you know, quote unquote, um, except this population, right? Um, so there's still a way to work to use that language to flip it. Like some people are beginning to make the argument that prison that with the way we're treating prisoners yeah. isn't is not sustainable, it's not profitable because there are these all these costs that we're bearing that we're not going to be able to continue to bear, you know, but you know, the cause, but, you know, we'll see. Um, but on technologies of subjection and technologies of uh, subjectivity, I'm not going to be able to be as precise as I would like here, but what I want you to guys to think about is think about the ways that you govern yourself, right? Think about the ways that you govern yourself as a, as technologies themselves, right? The way you're taught to think of yourself as an actor. There are way, and then think about ways or devices that you use, talking about cells as opposed to cities 
um, or states or institutions. Think about ways that we govern, uh, that you govern other people around you, right? So there are people who you believe have the capacity to perform labor, who you feel have the capacity to perform the way you want them to, and you use certain types of motivational techniques in getting them to work. And then you've got people who you don't think have the capacity to do what you want them to do. So you find motivational ways to, uh, you find ways to make them work that really are motivational in as much as you, that a stick is motivation. Right? So, so I will talk about the city, I'll talk about individuals that are moving to cities. Right? So um, at the individual level, um, you know, like, like students, I'll, I'll use my class. Like students who are self-starters, you know, I can, give them, I can give them praise. I can tell them, like, listen, no, I, all I need you to do is just do what you do. Oh, man, I, so, I believe in you, right? People who aren't self-starters, well, listen, you know what? If you're not able to do what they can do, then what I'm going to do is take away your stuff until you show me you have the capacity to do what they do. Right? So once that you got technologies of subjectiv subjectivity, that is you're dealing with people, cities, or institutions that have the capacity to act and grow on their own. They have agency. And then you've got cities, institutions, and individuals that don't have the capacity. And you need to actually you know, use, the, use the heavy hand of government. So that brings to mind, so some people would make the claim that there's a contradiction embedded in neoliberalism and that neoliberalism isn't about, you know, you've got these small government techniques in, these one, in this one place, but then you've got these heavy-handed government techniques in this other place. It's not a contradiction if you separate the population, if you understand that there are some people, some, <coughs> some spaces, and some institutions that can't work for themselves, they actually require government. You know, to either cordon them off and keep them separate from everybody else or to force them to engage in labor. Whereas you've got these other people, these other cities, these other, the other, these other institutions that can kind of govern themselves, right? So, uh, so I'm like a self-starter. Every day I get up to work. And if I don't write, I feel bad. And then I use the self-help stuff to figure out, like, man, I need to start writing better. I need to start writing better. So I read all these productivity things to figure out how to develop my own human capital, right? That's a technology of, of subjectivity that I happen to use on myself. That's not the man telling me. That's not the white man telling me. That's not white supremacy telling me. That's me saying, like, damn, I need to really get on this grind and write. I need to get on this grind and write. And I divide the technologies myself. Um, so I'm really interested, again, continuing with this sort of line of subjectivity, subjectivity, subjection. It's almost like the one gets the sticker and the one gets the stick. But the, uh, um, I'm working my way through security, territory, population. Talking, so this idea of, it was the pastor, who the shepherd who knows what's best for you, that's, it was that form which would move on into governmentality. Um, in neoliberalism. So I want to I want to hear you talk a little bit more about like, you know, we we send these welfare moms to work because it's good for them. Yes. We send black men to prison because it's good for them. So how how does this kind of pastoral we know what's best kind of patriarchal thing? Uh, to, uh, okay. So um, and I apologize. I might get. I tried to talk like at a. You know, even though I'm a professor, I tried to talk at like kind of an undergraduate, low undergraduate level, but I might end up moving into a level above that. Uh, so there are, are, so I believe that the black men prison thing are actually a different, that's actually a different category. I believe, so the argument there is that this is a population that we simply cannot, you know, we cannot govern, right? We can't govern using using means of discipline or using means of, you know, of, uh, you know, we have to put them aside, right? Because they, we can't, we can't control them. We don't have the technology to control them. Um, I mean, we don't have the technology to control them with everybody else. They need to be off on their own. With women, 
with women on welfare, the idea is that they, uh, they, uh, is that they need to control their own power of production, right? Uh, and if you think about it, there are a couple of different levels to it. One is literal reproduction, you know, sexual reproduction. So there are all these ideas about the capacity of of single women on welfare, the propensity of them to keep on having kids. Um, but it's also their, their human capital. And the best way for them to learn to manage their human capital is to actually incentivize them to develop that human capital. So you incentivize them by taking away the resources they need to live as opposed to giving them. Because if you give them the resources that they need to live without them developing their human capital, they have no incentive to develop that human Right? So that's kind, of the, that's kind of the logic, right? where we're trying to get them, and through a variety of different devices, through a variety of different um, methods, we're trying to get them to govern themselves the way everybody else governs themselves. Right? Particularly, particularly in as much as we don't want them, not only do we not, do we want them to be productive, we don't want them to take that thing and give it to that kid they have. Right? We don't want them to take, you know, to the extent you think about this as a disease of sort. You don't want that disease passed on. So the more we get them to learn how to govern themselves, the better parent they'll be, the better parent they are, the better kid they'll be. And then the, uh, the more, going back to Foucault, the more the population, the better the uh, health of the population. Uh, the, yeah, the better the health of the population. Hold on, sorry. So I'll, I'll, I'll give them another bite, but I want to see if there are any other questions first, particularly because it's like 10 to. Yeah. Yeah, with the diamonds in Africa, it was supply and demand too. Yeah, yeah, so, the, so that, that thing is really, so diamonds from uh, Sierra, Sierra Leone is a, is a really interesting track because the track itself is actually about the contradictions embedded and MCs supporting being black and believing in the certain concept of black empowerment, but supporting uh, an endeavor that literally results in the life, uh, in, the, uh, in the death of thousands and thousands upon thousands of people who look like them, who they would claim as being part of their family. So the fact that that line is in there is actually, is, is really interesting. It really complicates that track. You should see a, a blood diamond. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you have a question, Leo? Yeah. Um, so I think the concept of neoliberalism is totally, is extremely accurate to describe what's happening in uh, like the economy and politics right now. But uh, the word is really regrettable because um, even a highly educated person, like other people at this conference maybe who aren't familiar with the term, you'll use the word and they'll think, oh, that's like Hollywood liberals trying to do an ineffective like regime of human rights or something like that. And it takes a while to get even someone who's totally familiar with all these concepts onto the same page with like this is the ideology of free market governing society. And if it's someone who's not ha highly educated, like forget about it. So my question is, is like how do we talk about this on a level that's going to be, not, I'm not going to say low brow, but like popularly accessible? Um, so the way, thank you, uh, the way or a way to do that, so what we're talking about really is fighting for the public, right? Because what the neoliberal, what this neoliberal turn is basically allowed for is the dissolution of the public, right? We don't even think about, the, we don't really talk about the public interest. We don't think about public goods in the same way that we used to. Um, so to that extent, I think one route to go to, to do is to look at the spe very specific, my, my vibration thing no longer works. <laughs> now, if you, now, if you guys want to haze me, you can. <laughs> but my vibration thing no longer works. I just realized that sounds kind of weird saying that. <laughs> um, what, one route is to look not at neoliberalism, but to look at its very specific manifestations and get people to think through what the negative aspects of those manifestations are. So I'll give you one specific idea 
Uh, because once you actually think about this stuff through, you see this thing happen in a number of different places. I have um, five children, and my children go to a public school, public elementary school that I really like. Right. Um, one of the most important dynamics of schooling is is kind of getting kids to manage themselves. Right. And there are actually are there are politics here. Right after this, I'm going to the, the parenting thing. You know, there is a politics here, but I, I mean, as a parent, you can't just have people, kids do not have the capacity to govern themselves for them, right? They don't. Physiologically, they don't. So, they, every school has a behavior modification kind of program, right? My kid's school gives kids cash. Not real cash, wine and books, right? Wine and books. They give them money, and I'm like, oh my God, where does this go? This is like, I study this, I write about this. What the hell, right? So, if you think about that, it's, it, you know, if you think of they become entrepreneurs of themselves, if they learn how to manage their own capacity to govern themselves, they get cash, right? And they can use that cash to buy goods. Now, how do you complicate that, right? How do you fight against that? So, I talked to the principal about it, because the principal was good people. The, I couldn't get the principal to understand kind of how problematic that was. So, but there are kind of ways to organize it, or at least to get people to think about those kids as citizens as opposed to entrepreneurs. So one way, and I'm just talking about, I'll talk my head, one way is to kind of get kids to think about um, asking, their, asking their teachers if they could cash in their dollars to smack kids around. Like, man, I've been, you know, I mean, that's really radical. But right, you know, like, so there are things you can't use the money for. Right? Like, you can't save it. Like, man, I saved all these wine bucks, you know. <laughs> what? <laughs> and then, you know, you know, you can't organize, you know, organizing, right? Like, wow, let's pool all our little wine and bucks together. And, you know what I mean? I mean, so they're way, so it's about taking very specific manifestations of it, whether it's at the deeply local level, like at the school, or, it's, or, or a classroom. Or a level up, like, okay, a school, like a race to the top type of dynamic, where you're getting people to think about how the problematic aspects of race to the top. Or you're thinking about things like how a city spends its money and the role of bond rating agents. If you have that conversation, you can have that conversation and get people to understand and work through the problems embedded in very specific policies much easier than you can getting them to understand and organize against the thing. And that actually applies whether we're talking about neoliberalism or racism or any type of structural dynamic. You always want to organize from people's lived experiences and move outward as opposed to, to starting at a high theoretical level of abstraction and then moving downward. Right? Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit on the uh, a couple of points. Say so you got the bond rating governance, but that's also a space of increasing market and closure. You know, with like increasing bubbles, like in sovereign debt, for example. Yeah. And uh, both at the national level as well as like local city levels and stuff. So I wonder if you could, you know, uh, elaborate that on that a little bit. But as well as like the basic ethic of neoliberalism, which is kind of like this um, uh, utopian vision whereby the peak of human achievement can be exchanged through. The market govern as many human interactions as possible. You know, like you're feeling depressed, don't don't go talk to your neighbor about it. Put it in the market. Go talk to a counselor. You know, things like like the way that it increases like you know enclosure uh, market enclosure spaces and yeah yeah it, yeah it's, it really is a it's really a radical utopian project where the where they where the goal is to have the market govern everything. Yeah. Right, your relationship with God, yeah. your relationship with your spouse. You know how you how your city runs, how your government runs. It, it's an attempt to control everything. Now it's not always successful, and that's something that's important, right? Because there's a way to talk about it like it's everywhere. It's not everywhere. It's differentially rolled out, and in some places you actually have more. Uh, you, you actually have rollback in, in some specific instances. Not a lot in the U.S. context, mostly in Latin America, but you have rollback. Um, so it's not everywhere yeah. on the bond rating agencies. Um, I, they're been, particularly given that they totally got missed this housing bubble, right? So there were, there are bond rating agents who rated bonds that they knew were junk as being incredibly high. 
So we've actually got a moment now to engage in significant pushback, even at the, even at the point of rhetorically suggesting other ways that we might evaluate cities, right? Because the reality is, is, that, is that in a, in a certain way, we do need a way to evaluate cities, populations, institutions. Um, but it's just about articulating a new, both showing the contradiction, showing that, in these, that these bond rating agencies don't do anything like what they say they're going to do. They don't give you an objective rating. They don't give you a rating that, um, that, that, that's actually predictive and you can work with. Um, so it's about critiquing that and then presenting some type of alternatives. And that, that dynamic is really a long-term struggle and kind of an ideational project where we're, it's about us coming up with ideas and then vehicles through which to disseminate them, whether it's popular culture like we try to or other vehicles. Right? Um, it's 4 o'clock. Hey, real quick, my name is Lester Spence. I can be found on Twitter at Lester Spence, Facebook, Lester Spence, website, LesterSpence.com. There's a lot more stuff embedded in this than what I was able to talk to today, and I'm hoping that I um, am able to, to dig through that. You know what? And real quick, I want to give a shout out. Uh, for those of you who don't know, 2640 not only has like all types of books that deal with this, but at le in at least two of the presses, I mentioned this to Donna, she had no idea, so I'm telling you guys. And at least the case of AK Press and PM Press, if you give them just like $25, right, and become a friend, pay $25 a month, you will get everything they produce. Yeah. Everything they produce. So any of you who've gone to the book uh, bookstore and have spent money, any of you who think about going to the store, bookstore, or the book thing at 2640, and are thinking about spending money, um, take that into account. On that note, I'm out.